The worst thing that we could do is trust everybody fully. I, I, sometimes a statement that drives me crazy is you hear people say, well, I always try to believe the best. Why? We live in a world where <laughs> trust is earned, right? And when people just naively trust anybody, you can get in a lot of trouble. So part of trust is learning whom to trust, you know, what's trustworthy, whom to withhold it from how we need to earn it, and then how to fix it. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Paula Ferris Show. I am your host, Paula Ferris, and we are wrapping up this series on relationships. It is a conversation about trust. But before we do, I want to welcome in my co-host, my husband, John, to the conversation. And John, I've got to get your feedback on last week's conversation about sharing the domestic load with Fair Play's Eve Rodsky, you were not part of that conversation, but you have listened to the episode and I got to get your hot take on it. Yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, what I liked about it is the the systematic approach to it. Most of the time we go into a marriage and we just start to figure out who does what and we don't yeah. really talk about it. We don't really structure it. I think you get to that point over time, most successful marriages do, but they never come in with that proactive approach. And I, I really took away that the more proactive you are setting up the boundaries, really identifying what systems work, what systems don't work. And then most importantly, just how you communicate with your partner. She said that a lot. Communication is the key to pretty much every relationship, but especially a marriage. So I, yeah. I, I took a lot away. I was, I was kind of I want to say convicted by some of the things, but I, I really shined a light on maybe some areas of our marriage that we can improve, yeah. even though we've gotten a lot better, but we still have, a lot we have, Oh gosh, we have a, a lot, a lot of areas for improvement. The conversation is so triggering. A lot of women don't even want to have it and we don't know yeah. how to have it. Did you feel triggered at all? Like, and, and how can you encourage the women out there to invite their partners to listen to or to watch that conversation because we don't want to come across as nags, you know, and then yeah. it's like, oh, I just rather do it myself. But then those things start to add up over time. And next thing you know, again, like Eve says, yeah. you end up divorcing for the stupidest things. Like yeah. somebody left a sponge in the sink. So how do we invite our partners to have that conversation to get them to listen to that episode? Because I think it's really important. Yeah, I think if you're coming from the place of Hey, I want our marriage to be the best marriage possible. I want our relationship to be the best. I want our household to be the best as possible. And I, I think anybody, if if you came to me, Paula, and said, Hey, I think we as a collect and, and that's the issue. If it's you need to do better, you need to step up. I don't think anybody likes to hear that. That's yeah, very that's condemning. Triggering. That's that is extremely triggering. But if Hey, I want our marriage to be the best marriage. I want our family. I want our household. Are we, if we use those collective words, I think most individuals would say, yeah, I think there's ways that we together, as long as we're both lifting and having mm. what she kept talking about, the fair play in our marriage, I think most individuals would be open to that. You seem to be really be intrigued by running your home like you run a business. You say that's where you're really going to get a lot of guys to buy in. Well, I think a lot of men, they, you know, we think in a more analytical, more business. It has to make sense. Give me the bullet points. Let's, what's the action plan and let's go yeah. attack. And so that's, that, that's essentially what this is. It's an action plan, a system, a, a blueprint, whatever you want to call it, a game plan for how to have a most successful household mm -hmm. and most successful marriage boundaries, systems, and communications. We mm -hmm. have, again, a lot of room for improvement in each of those, but I think it's our communication. I really took away, you know, the clear expectations. What does our minimum standard of care mean for ownership of this task? So if like yeah. I ask you to do something or vice versa, you ask me to do something, often we'll come back and say, well, if you wanted to done a certain way, you should have just done it yourself. I think that's I've never where... said that, Paula. I've never said that. Just kidding. Just kidding. You say it all the time. And I say it too, but yeah. I think having that communicating over it. Hey, John, I want you to make lunches today. And we're having a conversation about it. Here's my minimum standard of care of ownership mm -hmm. means, mm -hmm. hey, put some fruit and vegetables in it. Okay. And then you take ownership over it or I take ownership over it. And what she's saying is, I respect you. I'm going to own it. And then if I mistake, I'm going to own the mistake and communicate. Yep. And I think that's a, an area where you and I can like work on right away. Just our For communication sure. over those tasks, but also yep. going through it. You've done a much better job. I do want to give you props. You actually Thank you. kids teacher this year, which I think is the first time you have. And our kids are in 10th, 8th and 
for you. Yeah, so it, it, it takes some on, time. It's come, it's come it a long way, <laughs> but, we're, but we're communicating about it. So yeah. big thanks to Eve. Eve also said in the Great conversation, message. I thought it was good too, but it, again, it's really tough to have that conversation and it's triggering and you and everybody gets on the defensive. And we, we have those conversations when she says emotion is high and cognition is low and it's got to be the opposite yeah. of that. She said that accountability and trust are two of the most important aspects, are the most important aspects in a relationship, which leads us to introduce today's guest, John, who is the trust expert. We are talking to Dr. Henry Cloud. I'm excited for everybody to listen to this conversation. Trust, again, the most important aspect in any relationship. He's going to talk to us about how we can foster it and build it and how to repair it when it's broken. Yeah. Yeah, what I found out about Dr. Cloud is I could easily trust him because I know he's a really good golfer and we already had that connection there. And so because of that, I was more open to trusting what he had to say about trust. But no, it's it's a, it's a great conversation and you guys are going to really enjoy it. We're going to get right back into the conversation, but I want to take a moment to tell you about a friend of mine, Carlos Whitaker, who has a podcast, the Carlos Whitaker podcast. And Carlos does something better than just about anybody else I know. He has this uncanny knack for bringing people together together from all over the world. And we're at a unique time in history where we've never been more connected, but sadly, we've never felt lonelier and more isolated. And Carlos brings people together. He puts so much good into the world. If you're craving good news, if you're craving a space to engage in conversation about topics that really matter to you, I encourage you to check out his show. One of my favorite episodes is a recent episode with his wife, Heather. They talk about being completely night and day, total opposites, including opposites opposites on their views and how they make it work. Carlos's motto is don't stand on issues, walk with people. And I encourage you, friend, today to check out his podcast. Oh, Dr. Cloud, sure. we are good friends. And I'm excited to introduce you to my best friend, my husband, John. Nice to meet you, Dr. Cloud. Oh, hey, I didn't realize that was hey. me, John. That's yeah, me, John. 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 That's my husband. <laughs> I've had enough Experience where if you if you ever need a little support I need or a empathy, ton. Just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it takes a it takes a village to to live and work with Paula. I don't think I can fix her. That'd be impossible. Yeah. <laughs> but I can. Uh, do you really do you really want to fix me though? I mean, I think my quirks kind of make me who I am. I would have to ask your key stakeholders what they want fixed. You know, <laughs> okay. <and so. laughs> okay. How much time do we have? That's a whole yeah. other conversation, John. What do you want? No, fixed? I, I can't go there because it will be a, a full 30 minute conversation. If you could do that in 30 <laughs> minutes, that's amazing. What? Well, before you hopped on, he was criticizing my sweatpants with my nice sweater. He's, he was just like, Paula, I got to save you from yourself. That's one thing he would fix would probably be my sartorial of my wardrobe choices. Correct? Yeah, that's, it's not that big of a deal, but yes. I just want you to be the best version of you. That's it. <laughs> Dr. Claude, one thing you know about me, I come in real hot, right? I'm kind of like she's, a, a, she's a bulldog. Toggle switch. Exactly. On or off. So there's no, there's no medium with me. I'm on or I'm off. So I was saying one thing I think John and I have come a very long way is trusting one another. And that was not always the case. We have been together since 96, married since 2000. So as our children say, we've been together since the 1900s, <laughs> which makes us feel real old. But I want to talk to you because- My parents come from another <laughs> century. <laughs> but we've been through it, a lot of ups and downs, and we'll get into those in a little bit. And by the way, thank you for joining us. Um, so grateful. You're a very good friend of mine and excited for you to- to really kind of help navigate John and I through this conversation. Why is trust the most important aspect in any relationship, not just a partnership like John and I have, but really in any relationship? Well, it, it literally is in any relationship, where it's per whether it's personal or business or extended family. It's basically because of this. Trust fuels all of life because trust is it's sort of like, you know, the conduit. We can't get life from ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, when a baby mm -hmm. comes into the world, you you had kids, right? Three of when them. They, did they pop out and say, oh, mom, I'm, I'm sorry. Was that hard on you? L l let me clean up around. No, they didn't do that. What they did was, <laughs> <laughs> why? Because they, for the first time, had been separated from life. Mm. And so now they're looking for life from outside. And if we can't trust, we can't take in a relationship, we can't connect, we can't bond, we can't attach, we can't get feedback, we can't get our strengths built, nothing works without trust. And 
if we can't do that, or if we trust the wrong people, think what happens, you're taking in bad stuff. Yeah. Right. And so we could go on and on, but, but, but when you get to, to relationships like marriage, I like to use the word careless. It's a great word about trust. When we have great trust, we can be careless in the sense of, you don't have to be watching your back. You can, what do you do? You let down, you fully engage. Your husband goes on a trip. You're not checking his phone. No, you can be careless. I trust him. He's going to be fine. And you can do what you've got to do. We're wired to be able to be both feet in. Have you ever been in a relationship where somebody's got one foot in? Well, that's a, that trust is broken down there mm-hmm, somewhere. Mm-hmm. You can break down from either side. Yeah. Careless. And not everyone has that um, experience where their partner goes away and they're not checking the phone. You know, they, they don't trust them when they're away. And that's when the trust has broken down. And so, sometimes for good reason. I mean, yeah, just absolutely. the worst thing that we could do is trust everybody fully. I, I, sometimes a statement that drives me crazy is your people say, well, I always try to believe the best. Why? We live in a world where <laughs> the be- trust is earned, right? And 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 when people just naively trust anybody, mm-hmm. you can get in a lot of trouble. So part of trust is learning whom to trust. Oh, you that's know, good. What's trustworthy? Who to withhold? Whom to withhold it from? How we need to earn it, and then how to fix it. So it is a big deal in every relationship. So you're saying, especially marriage. So you're saying the trust me. I'll trust you until you give me a reason not to is not necessarily a healthy way to go about it. Well, let me ask you this. Did you marry him on the first date? No. It took a few. I never it thought John, a few, actually. I never thought John was yeah. going to ask. <laughs> you should trust him until he gives you a reason not to, right? Yeah. See, our engagement, and, and if you think about the word investment, trust fuels investment. You know, if somebody's going to invest in a deal, you know, financially, they go through a lot of due diligence to invest, to make make themselves vulnerable. Another way to look at trust is trust is when we put ourselves intentionally in a position where we mm. can be hurt yeah. mm. in order to get something that we need. You're not going to just say, well, I'll put myself in a position with you until you show me why I shouldn't. That's that's good. Trust is incremental and it's, it's learned. That's why... Um, it, even though he was trustworthy on the first day, mm-hmm. your heart had to experience that over time to open up more. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. Sometimes we're blind to them. And yeah, we Dr. Do get Gow, yeah you, you said something that, you know, really sparked interest in me. You said due diligence and you're speaking my language because, you know, I'm in commercial real estate. So we're always looking at deals and trying to figure out what won't work versus what will work before we invest in something. Is there a, yeah. some recommendations for due diligence? Right. The building might look great. Never that we love it. Isn't yep. she beautiful or isn't he great? <laughs> and then what do you do? You go into a. Yep escrow period and you call in the inspectors and you look, well, what's yeah. behind the drywall? Is there termite, you know, and, and then you're going to invest more. So are there some relational things somebody. we should be doing some relational due diligence with uh, new people that we're meeting or existing people that we're trying to really grow and build trust with? Yeah. And, and this, even if, even after we're in a relationship, what I tried to do in the book was to give people kind of a GPS of trust, you know, an algorithm of, if the if you can check these boxes, then that's that. Then we can get to a place where we hit go. Mm-hmm. And the first one is just be aware. Do I feel understood by this person? Yeah. We trust someone when we know that they understand what we need, what's going to hurt us, what we like, and and you find that out by the other party has got to be interested in knowing you how many times you've ever been in a relationship and you say something and instantly boom they start talking about themselves Mm -hmm. and you that's that little feeling of oh am i here (laughs) yeah are they listening to me (laughs) do Do they care do i exist in marriage how many times do you hear somebody say something like he doesn't get me he doesn't listen i listen to you all the time you just didn't listen again Mm -hmm. You know, that invalidation, the defensiveness, all of that closes down the heart a little bit. I've got a Doberman. 
And she is, I mean, if a stranger comes to the door, she's not going to believe the best. She shows up and makes some, you know, but when I walk in or Tori walks in, she, you know, first she jumps and then what happens? Her ears go back and she lies down because she wants her tummy scratch, but she's submitting to the relationship Mm. and she's opening up because she knows that we know her. Mm. And that's why you hear so much on, you know, with like big thing today, you know, how hard it is to have a relationship with a narcissist. One of the key things that narcissists do is they invalidate somebody else's experience. Well, it didn't hurt. No, it didn't. Mm. I didn't do that. No, you don't feel that way. And it creates horrible yeah. aloneness, yeah. even in a marriage. Mm-hmm. So feeling understood is the primary number one foundation. It's not enough, but it's a foundation. It's, it's really good. good. John, do you do you feel like we have a good foundation there that that I understand you that I'm listening to you? You do say quite a bit. You're not listening to me, and I say that to you as well. No, I, I think we have developed a lot of trust over the years, but there, you know, we live in a world of distractions, and that's one of the biggest challenges. When I say I don't feel like you're listening or I'm not listening, like we've got work, we got phone, we got emails, we got kids, we've got a lot of things going on. Yeah, and I, I think trust is built in that one-on-one situation where you're really just, hey, I, I'm listening, I'm yeah. empathetic with you, you're, you know, being vulnerable with me, and that back and forth is that's where real trust that what we found has really been grown when we just kind of put away the distractions and it's just the two of us sure. engaging. Yeah. So Dr. Club, that yeah. leads me to ask you, well, how do we in relationship in any relationship? And again, you said trust is the most important aspect in any relationship, not just a partnership like John and I have. How do we foster trust? How do we build that trust with someone that we have decided <laughs> is worth building and fostering it with? Worth, go- worth going the next step. Continuing the conversation, <laughs> not getting off the bus, yeah. right? Oh, well, well, you know, just think of that experience. Gosh, I'd like to know more about you. See, it's other oriented. John, the, the, the point about the distraction, you know, the word psychologists use is attunement. Mm. And when we feel like somebody's tuning in, there's an emotional presence. You're not like looking around. And when somebody's tuning in, sure. number one, what do you see? You hear yep. tones. Mm-hmm. Their tone matches what you're saying, their focus, just their emotional presence. We're wired neurologically with mirror neurons and all sorts of other systems. When we feel attuned with, the system begins to open up. So that's the first foundation. The second one is, you know, somebody can be attuned to you, but they can be tuning into you in order to manipulate you. Oh, wow. You know, that's what predators do. Right? It's what some salespeople do. The second one is, who's this for? In other words, what's their motive? Mm-hmm. What's their agenda? You know, we've all been in relationships where you get an email from somebody, I got a good deal for you. And you know that person and you go, yeah, yeah right, for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's really for them. And we really trust somebody when we feel like they've got my back, even when I'm not around. Mm-hmm. Even when I'm not there to protect myself, they're looking out for me. Simple example in marriage. I'm a golfer and I can be out somewhere and somebody say, hey, hey, you want to play on Saturday? And I look at my phone and go, yeah, I can play. (laughs) I'll see you at 10. I'm sorry. This is very relatable right now because this is what happens in our house. I'll play any day with any stranger. That's for sure. I love the game of golf. Yeah. Hey, we have to talk. (laughs) Okay, take that example. Yeah, I can play. I'll, I'll see you Saturday at 10. Versus, it looks like, you, you know, I might be able to. Let me check with Tori and see what she's going on, got, got going on with the family or herself or whatever. See, see, the second part of trust is that you always have the other person's needs and considerations and how what I'm going to do is going to affect them good. or what, how good. can I help mm, them That's good. in mind? John Gottman, the great marriage researcher says that a betrayal is anytime one party does something or makes a decision without taking into consideration the effect it's going to have on the other. See, that's when we're not only tuned into you, but, I'm really for you. I want good for you yes. instead of just for myself. That's good. That's really good. When a marriage orients, it, or orients itself or one per, around just their needs, 
and they're not for what's good for the other person. You, and I think most relationships say- start that way. It's about the, it's about yeah. me. And over time it kind of morphs into, it's about we, I know that's been my experience or our experience. It's just, it takes time. It's, it's not natural to always be interested in other people wanting what's best for them. We want what's best for us. And if it works out for them, that's even a bonus. So you've come a long way, John, with that. And I will say, because I would say until recently, he would just go ahead and book that for some or book. Yeah. Or book his Saturday afternoon and hasn't even, it's not like he needs my permission. That's not it at all, but we're a partnership. And I'm just like, what do I always say? How's it going to affect you? I just, I always say, I just wish you would think of me. That's all. And you've come a long way. I will say you're doing a much better job. And that for me really connects me with you. And I can, I feel like I can trust you even more because I feel like you're thinking of me and you're being considerate of me. So I just wanted to give you some props because also his one of his love languages is yes, words of affirmation you. right now, Dr. Cloud. So I'm filling his love bucket too. <laughs> but the same there time. There you go. Filling it right now. Yeah. Well, John, even in a deal, you know, you've got, got clients or you're leasing a building to or you're, you know, considering buying something or something. And everything's yep. going great, right? What happens when you call them and say, you know, I was thinking about you and I know you've already said it's great, but I was thinking about, you know, I know a guy who, who could move that wall. And when I thought about your business, I think it might even be better, yeah. even though they've already said yes. Right. I think it might be better if, if we could get that done, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cost you anything, but I think it'd be good for you. You think when he's got to buy another building, oh, yeah. who's he going to call? Mm-hmm. Right. Because not only do you understand his business well right. enough or her business and know how it's got to work, you're actually thinking of them while they're not even there. You're doing what's in their their best interest, not just your own. That's right. That's good. So if you get those two down, then we get to a really heavy one. I I, I use the example, I I had a couple of knee replacements in the last few years. And what if I went to Dr. Empathy and he's so caring and understanding, he wants my knee to get better. And I know he's not just here so he can bill me. And I got the first two, right? And then I say, okay, doc, let's do it. He goes, that's great. I'm really excited about doing your knee because, because I'm an OB-GYN. I've never done a knee before and I've always wanted to. And this is going to be, yeah. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Wrong area. Wait for a little different, different area of the body, right? <laughs> the third one is, do they have the ability to pull off what I'm mm. entrusting to them? Mm-hmm. Do they have the skills? Do they have the, the capacity, the capability. I touched on it briefly, and we're not going to get too into the weeds. John and I had a very hard time early on in our marriage. We've been married going on 24 years, and we were separated. <laughs> the, the trust had been irretrievably broken. We don't need to get into details, but like we were not angels. We were living apart, headed for divorce. What do you do in that situation? And I'm not going to necessarily get into our story about how we worked through it, but how do you advise people to to work through it when the trust is broken? What do you do? How do you work through it? How do you know when to reconcile and how do you know when to walk away? Well, it's a big topic. There's a whole path mm-hmm. and there's some key mistakes. And I lay it out in the book because they're, they're real important steps. And both sides of this, the yes or no decision, mistakes can be made. Sometimes pe- the person comes and they've hurt somebody in some way and they come back and they're broken hearted and so repentant and I'm so sorry and, and please forgive me and please forgive me. And forgiveness takes place. I'll go, great, I forgive you. And then they start to move forward from there. Like, okay, it's all is forgiven. Let's do better. And they really make a commitment. Well, Forgiveness has to do with the past, and that's free. Trust has to do with the future, Mm -hmm. and trust is always earned. Mm -hmm. So I can forgive someone, and I can, you know, be reconciled, and, yeah, I'm I'm good. Because the second thing is, did they fully own it? If you're going to repair something, and somebody is saying, well, I'm really sorry, but, you know, you weren't meeting my needs, or this, that, and that, if they're still externalizing the reasons for their behavior, they're not ready to be trusted yet until they can own, I can see what? I can see 
Think about the list we talked about. I can, I really hear how I hurt you. And you need to feel Mm. that they get it, what this does to you, because if they don't see what it did to you or does to you, then they're blind to it for tomorrow. Mm. And so we've got to see ownership. We've got to see true sorrow. On the other side, we got to see forgiveness. You know, (laughs) I just said forgiveness doesn't mean you go make yourself vulnerable to being hurt again. Forgiveness means, no, we've dealt with the pain and the anger and everything of already being hurt so we don't take it into the future. You know, if you're holding revenge and all that kind of stuff. Now, what that doesn't mean, and this is really important because I've seen couples, something happens that triggers her yeah. or triggers him about what happened back here. Yes. And they start to feel the pain or get scared. And then he'll get defensive or she'll get defensive. I th- See, I thought you forgave me. Why can't you just forgive me? Well, I forgave you, but I can walk out of here and get hit by a truck today and forgive the drunk driver that hit me. But I got to go to rehab, <laughs> to, you know, when I have to the surgeries, sometimes the pain of something can take a while. And the other party sometimes has to sit there and just, in a sense, hear it all again, but not in a vengeful way, but in a, the pain is working itself out. Now, when, when you feel like somebody really cares non-defensively about how they've hurt you in the past, that's telling me, oh, I'm dealing with somebody different now. Yeah. And I can take another little step because they really are oriented that way. Then the next part, do you see a lack of self-centeredness? In other words, they're taking your, they're, they're thinking about how something might affect you. They weren't thinking about that before. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing more of an other, other orientedness, if you will, other orientation. They're, they're, your needs are becoming more and more important. You're, you're seeing them mindful of this and they've developed the competencies That's good. and the skills. That's good. You know, if, if somebody can't resolve a conflict and we trust breaks down because we're always fighting, well, just to forgive and go forward and let's reconcile. We want to hold our marriage together. Well, what are they doing to build the skills? So it's going to be different tomorrow. And when we get a sense that somebody's really working on themselves vis-a-vis the ways that come into the relationship and they're self-motivated. In other words, you're not making them go to counseling. You're not making them go to therapy. They have a drive of growth. We trust people when we, th- when we can see they care more about their getting better than we do. Mm, yeah, that's see, really Now good. I can trust you to not have to nag you into being a good spouse because you're trying to turn into a better person on your own. Mm-hmm. So we see that, and then obviously there's, you know, we got to see a track record. Yeah. You know, we you build it step by step. So it's a big topic, a lot to go into. But there, what I want to tell people is I've seen the most horrible situations healed and turned around. I've seen very similar situations enabled and continuing because somebody doesn't stand up to it and stop it. But these factors of trust weren't worked on. And it gets broken down. So, yes, things can be healed. Yes, sometimes they don't. But what I tell, and especially spouses, and and, and she'll go, I don't know. How do I know I can trust him again? I don't know. You're asking me to, he's asking me to trust. I go, look, the last thing you need to be is a fortune teller. I can't, I don't want you out there worrying about, can I trust, can I trust, can I trust? What we're going to do is we're going to outline a process. And they're very objective things that you can look at. I want you to sit in the bleachers, not try to guess where the game's going to go. I want you to know what to look for. And that's going to give you objective reasons to either hit pause or pull out or go forward. But people have got to learn to trust their gut. But also, sometimes our guts are broken. Mm. And sometimes people have yeah. commitment phobias because of past trauma. And they have a very trustworthy person, but they're micromanaging them. Yeah. And that'll break down trust, yeah, too. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I see that a lot where you come into a relationship and people have scar tissue from 
past mistrust or broken down and, and that can really you know you're not starting in a level playing field with somebody new because they're feeling like this next person who i'm getting into a relationship is going to do what the last person did and yeah, i'm sure you address that or do you have any advice for how to handle a situation like that it, it's true in all areas of life i bet you, you've been in the business long enough how easy was it for you to get somebody to buy a commercial building in 2010. That's right. They got burned. And, and what the, what's going to happen is, as you walk along with them and they feel more and more of, you're not persuading them first. So a lot of times we'll try to, Oh, you can trust me. You can. And we're trying to talk somebody into that. Well, psychologically, neurologically, They've got to feel like we understand them. So when they don't trust John, you say, you got burned. I can understand that. Tell me more about that. And they start to unpack and you go, he did what? Mm -hmm. Your broker did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? How did he pull that up? And you're getting more and more and more. Gradually, they're saying, wait a minute. I can't trust now because of what happened back then. But this guy really understands yeah. what that person did to me. And you see that in marriage, you know, marriage is a great place where people can be healed from past relationship and past trauma because they finally got somebody on the other side that's entering into their woundedness with them and they're not in it alone anymore. So, gosh, if I didn't think we could heal from past trauma, I'd have to get another <laughs> career, right? Because it's kind of what we do. <laughs> this has been so great, Dr. Cut. I feel like we could continue oh, sure. to talk to you for a long time. And just the principle of trust. And like you said, all relationships, even in business, yep. you know, especially in business with John and business, you know, the business that I conduct too. But I feel like we just kind of like scratched the surface of this conversation, but it's been really That's why you got to read his book. Yes. Well, you guys are fun. I don't know any of the particulars, but when you say y'all, y'all went through a hard time early in marriage and, and struggle, even separated, I think yep. you said, yes. is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just want to give um, some hope to some people out there. And and not every situation should be saved. Right. right? There right. are non-trustworthy things that you want to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. But so many times, you know, I've never been to a wedding where the two people went down to the altar and turned to each other and said, I can't wait to hate you with every fiber of my being. I can't wait to only our attorneys talk to each other. I can't. No, there was something there and there was a reason. Yeah. But sometimes we have to grow in the dynamics of how to be in a relationship and how to be in a relationship with that person. And so anyway, uh, my hat's off to y'all. You're a good model of this and, I want to yeah. give people hope. So well, much. we are a work in progress, Every though. day, every We're way, we get progress. a little better. Yep. When are you guys there golfing? That's like the, I know you've been waiting to talk oh, about that. yeah. Now, John, do you, where, how much I, do you I, play? What's your I, handicap? I play, all of that, right? Yeah, what's handicap, handicap? 4.6. So it's, um, yeah, um, playing some decent golf. Yes. But it's, it's a, it's a, now that I have a son, or I have two sons, both my boys are playing. So it's a lot of fun to get out with them as well. And, and I do it a lot for business, you know, in real uh, estate, we entertain a lot of clients on the golf course. And yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, you, <laughs> wait a minute, Paula. I know. I'm it wrong. It has been true. It is true. It's true. A lot of business yep. gets done on the golf course. Because you get to like people. And, and guess what? You find out a lot about trust. If they turn in the right score, how they act when they get a little frustrated. You learn a lot about somebody's worst mm -hmm. self when they're on the golf course. Yes. Yeah. It's good. Yes. Yeah. All right, John. Great job once again co-hosting and asking some great questions of Dr. Yeah. Henry Cloud. Uh, when is this going to stop being the Paula Ferris show and the the John and Paula show? When is that going to happen soon? Because I, I feel like I'm getting a lot of calls to to be on other shows, and I don't know. Did they're, they're I have that in your contract? Did I put a non compete in there? Uh, no, because there is no contract. So. And why would it have to be the John and Paula show? Why wouldn't it be the Paula and John show? That, that works. Involved. That's okay. fine with me. Just as long as my name is somewhere in there, I just want to be recognized. It's not P, it's P, B, and J, or it's P and J, not J and P. 
Whatever works. Whatever works. We can talk about it. Again, okay. we have to go back to the kind of the non existent contract yep. and drop drop the expectations. Okay. But maybe I'm drawing a boundary right now, John. Just just slow your roll. Maybe okay. maybe appear a couple more times. Let's see what okay. you do for ratings. All right. All right. Continue to like you. Yep. I love you. Uh, that's all that matters. <laughs> so, John, what do you think about the conversation with Dr. Henry Cloud, who, again, is a clinical psychologist? It was his book, Boundaries, years ago yeah. that just really put him on the map. And this new book, Trust, um, has really given a lot of people a, a, a ton of hope who are trying to regain that trust in broken relationships and also know when to walk away from yeah. that relationship. What do you take away? Yeah, trust is a, a powerful topic, and it is the the center of all relationships. If you trust somebody, typically the relationship is extremely strong. If you don't have trust somebody or you've been hurt in the past and have trust issues, the relationship is going to start off pretty weak. Uh, trust is earned. That was something he talked a lot about. And then probably my biggest takeaway was just how we need to be in tune with one another and understand how we can work together to trust each other, but also be in tune with ourselves. Maybe there's some areas that we're struggling with, or there's some issues that we need to really address so that we can be more trustworthy. And then we can also build that trust with that partner because it is a two-way street. And we've come a, a long way, as we mentioned a little bit of our own personal story, but you personally have come a long way too, I think in earning my trust and just thinking of me being thoughtful and that yeah. was for dr cloud he said that's huge with trust that's a, one of the, the basic components of it is caring about the other person yeah. enough to be thoughtful and considerate and that's really what it comes down to am i being considerate yeah. of the other person you weren't always like that i'll just no, be honest no definitely because i'm more attuned to some of my own shortcomings and i'm trying to improve on those because i i, yeah. I want you to feel like our relationship is trustworthy and that you can trust me and i can trust you and it's not something that happened overnight it's a yeah. slow and steady trust is built over time over consistency you know what i can always trust i can what always can trust for us to have a great conversation. Oh, yeah. Keep talking about it. Um, you are going to be here for next week's conversation, but it's a doozy because we're kicking off a series on work-life balance. Okay. Work-life integration, as some people call it. Uh, how do you juggle all the things? And John Acuff, our friend, who yes. is just, he's hes an incredible author, speaker, motivator. He's going to talk about how we can ditch the guilt of working and free ourselves from that guilt of working. A lot of us just have to work or we want to work and we carry a lot of guilt about it. So uh, a very freeing conversation that I can't yeah, wait looking for. Looking forward to hearing All it, Paul. Have. You know what we're going to keep doing? We're going to keep, as the sign says behind me. Talking about it. That's right. All right. All right, John. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I know, I know you guys thought you were done with me, but not quite yet. I have one more thing to tell you about. If you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, don't forget to subscribe to the show. I don't want you to miss a single beat or a single conversation. And remember, my DMs are always open. Tell me what you want to talk about.